Hello, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome once again to our weekly media briefing and public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich. I'm Lorna Vigeli, Hispanic Public Information Officer for Montgomery County Government, and joining us today is Dr. Keisha Davis, our Health Officer, as well as Mr. Sean O'Donnell, also from the Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Earl Strada, who's Assistant Chief Administrative Officer. And we do have a special guest today, Ms. Sylvia Taylor, Vice President for Novavax, which company headquarter in Gatorsburg that has been making headlines this week. Thank you for joining us, Mr. County Executive. Good afternoon to you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, actually, where I am, it's good morning. And uh, thank you all for joining me. Uh, just in case you're wondering, I'm conducting this briefing from a uh, San Francisco today. I came out for a couple of days of vacation, and I'm also I'm doing two days of touring uh, uh, some solid waste recovery facilities out here. Um, you know, California is often seen as being on the cutting edge of programs friendly to the environment, and they're doing things in the world of recycling and waste recovery that we do not do in Montgomery County. And uh, we, in fact, we have fallen far behind state of the art and what most well, I won't say most yet, but what more jurisdictions are doing to try to um, make better use of their waste stream and to monetize as much of it as possible. So I'm going to spend a couple of days visiting facilities out here since I'm already here. Um, we're planning to shut down the county incinerator, but in order to do that, we have to find better solutions for dealing with trash. And we're doing this as, <clears throat> as soon as possible. There are a lot of other jurisdictions, and I've been talking to a few of them, so this is just part of the work that we've been doing in order to come up with a plan so we can move forward on uh, closing the incinerator and having a more uh, sustainable and sensible program regarding our solid waste disposal. Uh, other news of the week, uh, we uh, just added another uh, vaccine option for the fall COVID vaccines. Um, this comes out of the, uh, um, hold on a second, my screen did a terrible jump. Um, this comes out of the, um, out of Novavax. And we heard, you know, some good news yesterday. The um, Food and Drug Administration uh, went forward and uh, approved their immunization to bring COVID-19 in people 12 and older. Uh, this is good news for them, but it's good news for us as well. Last month, I had an opportunity, along with a larger group that included several council members, to visit Novavax headquarters in Gaithersburg and meet with their CEO, John Jacobs, and other members of the leadership team. We also toured labs and met, met some of the employees who are working in R&D and quality control and operations there. Uh, the, the thing about the Novavax vaccine um, it's the only protein-based non-mRNA COVID vaccine option in the United States. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of you heard, you know, during all the, all the biggest noises about COVID that there are some people who didn't want to take mRNA vaccines. It wasn't the normal way vaccines were developed. And they wanted, to, they wanted a vaccine that was um, produced in the traditional way. So this is the traditional way of producing a vaccine, and hopefully that this group of people who've been holding out from getting vaccinated because they didn't like the other vaccines will come forward and take these vaccines. You know, I don't agree with their reasoning. I think they were fundamentally wrong, but the important thing now is this gives that group the opportunity to get a vaccine that they otherwise wouldn't have taken, and the more people that are vaccinated, the better it is for all of us. So however people arrive at doing the right thing, whether it's through an mRNA vaccine or a protein-based vaccine, the important thing is you get vaccinated, you keep yourself safe, and you keep the people around you safe. I'm glad to have uh, Sylvia Taylor here. She's Executive and Vice President and Chief Corporate Affairs and Advocacy Officer for Novavax, and she's going to join us today just to share some information. So Sylvia, thank you for joining, and I'm going to turn it over to you. 
Great. Thank you, County Executive Elrich, for having me today. It's very gracious of you to give me this time. Uh, we are so excited about the authorization of our COVID-19 vaccine yesterday. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but first of all, County Executive, I want to commend you for your leadership in Montgomery County. We are so proud to be housed here in Montgomery County, Maryland. And we have enjoyed so much support from you and the entire team of Montgomery County. Um, and, you know, I've been impressed, as I told you when I saw you a few weeks ago at our lab tour and site visit, how well you understand the science and follow it. Um, and I continue to be impressed with that today. You know, I think what's really important, as you mentioned, is that with the Nova vaccine, Novavax vaccine authorization yesterday, this is the first and only protein-based non-mRNA vaccine that's going to be offered in the United States and most parts of the world. And it comes right out of your backyard. Um, all of our backyard in uh, Montgomery County. So we're, we're so thrilled about that. I think to add a little bit more context, you know, yesterday um, we got the authorization, the emergency use authorization for the vaccine here in the United States. We also at the same, at the same time simultaneously got a recommendation from the CDC that will allow eventually the utilization of, of this vaccine. So that was really significant to be able to say we were authorized and then in the same day um, were, um, were recommended uh, for use. Um, you know, I think what's really important right now is as as you said, Mark, um, COVID-19 is not over. I know um, we're fatigued thinking about it, talking about it, um, but the fact remains that hospitalizations are still on the rise right now. Um, I would be surprised if, if everybody on this call doesn't know at least one person or more in their circle who is getting COVID-19. And so, you know, the threat remains, it is very serious. And we know that vaccination is the number one preventable way to make sure we're not contracting COVID-19 for ourselves, but also spreading it in the community and to our loved ones. So we know that vaccination isn't only important for keeping ourselves safe, but keeping our community safe. That's, that's incredibly important. Um, so the, the headlines here for us are that um, in September, we um, got millions of doses of our vaccine into the United States ready for yesterday's authorization. So where do we go next? Um, our next step is now that we're authorized and we have um, the recommendation from the CDC, we begin shipping in a matter of days. As soon as FDA um, releases batches, we begin shipping out to thousands of customers across the country. You know, we have um, signed contracts already with many retail pharmacies, national um, retail pharmacies, including CVS and Rite Aid. We'll be announcing many more um, in the week to come. We're also going to be available at thousands of health care provider offices and through vaccines for children and very importantly through the bridge access program that the administration has spearheaded to make sure that nobody is left behind and that everybody has access to uh, to vaccines for COVID-19 especially if they're under or uninsured. So um, I am happy with that to take any questions that you all have about the vaccine, about the rollout, because um, there's there's lots to talk about and I want to be sure I give you some time to uh, take your questions. Sounds good. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Members of the media, I see Suzanne Pollack already has her hand up. My MC Media, good afternoon, Suzanne. You have questions about good this afternoon. topic? Thanks. I was just wondering if you're going to be doing an advertising campaign or anything, because most people immediately think of the two vaccines that have been around for a couple of years. And um, I'm just wondering how you plan to get your name out or what you plan to do. Yeah, Suzanne, thank you for that question. I think it's a great question. Um, we absolutely are doing things to drive awareness of Novavax and our vaccine. You know, I think it takes a couple of forms. One, I think it's the importance, as we're talking about today, of making sure that people go and get vaccinated, right? And we also know that choice, having a choice in vaccine platforms and options will actually drive the behavior that we want to see, which is ultimately to get as many people vaccinated as possible. You know, specifically, we have research that shows that 25 to 30 percent of people are looking specifically for a protein-based non-mRNA option. And so the, the crux, I think, of all of the advertising and awareness that we're going to be doing is educating people that they now have a choice, that the choice is made by Novavax, 
and driving people to go to their pharmacies and healthcare provider offices to ask for that choice by name. So you'll see a lot of that in the form of advertising as well as public relations things, like talking to you all today, making sure that we get the word out and people know that we're authorized and will soon be available um, in the coming days. Thank you, Stan. Uh, members of the media, the Novavax press release is on the chat. Questions regarding this topic, please raise your hand. Heather Curtis, WMAL Radio. Good afternoon, Heather. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Great. So I have um, two separate questions. I'm wondering, and this may be something better suited for the county executive, um, will this have some sort of economic boom for the, econ for the local economy since this is something that's right in our backyard? Um. I don't think they have to scale up. I think they're prepared. They're prepared to do this. Already have vaccines ready. So I don't know if it's an immediate boost, but it certainly contributes to the health of the company. This is, you know, one of the major uh, products they were getting out. They actually, I think, had delayed doing some other work in order to make sure they got this vaccine out to the public. So I think it's overall healthy for us. And of course, you know, any any success story in the biotech industry becomes good for the industry as a whole. I mean, one thing is, you know, in doing some of the work we do is that people don't have an appreciation for what we as human beings are capable of doing. And if there's any industry in this country that, you know, on a regular basis is demonstrating the ability to change life outcomes and improve quality of life for people, it's this industry. And, you know, I take a lot of comfort and, and get a lot of hope out of what this industry is able to do, because I think it's a demonstration of what human beings are able to do. And I just wish more people looked about, looked at this and thought about it and maybe got a little less pessimistic about, we can't solve any of this, but actually realize if we put our mindset, we can solve a lot of things. Biotech industry is just the most foremost example of that right now. And Mark, I um, yeah, I'm I'm sorry. To add to that, um, Heather, if you don't mind, I think, um, you know, Mark, first of all, I love um, how you just described that and, and thank you for categorizing the effort um, that way. You know, I think, Heather, we have added hundreds of jobs as we have scaled up for this opportunity. Um, and so we have been, we have transformed ourselves three years ago, a small company of about, you know, 150 people to now, you know, almost 2,000 people doing this incredible work. I think we have a bright future for us at Novavax right now, very focused on getting our COVID vaccine you know, out into the market and demonstrating success. We have a rich pipeline, including a COVID influenza combination vaccine, um, which many people view as the holy grail, right? Instead of going to the pharmacy or your doctor to have to get two separate shots, you eventually will be able to get one. And as we continue to do that, that'll allow us to continue to bring in innovation and jobs um, into uh, Montgomery County. And Sylvia, those 2,000 people, are those all people who work in, a, in Montgomery County? We actually have people deployed all over the world. Um, we have a lot of employees, and the vast majority of our employees in the United States are here at our Maryland headquarters. We also, because we're a global company and we have um, agreements and contracts with governments and countries around the world, we do have some employees in Europe. But I would say the bulk of our employees and certainly our clinical development staff um, are here in, uh, in the Montgomery County area. Do you have any idea how many jobs you've added in Montgomery County since you started working on this? I think we can get back to you on that. Um, I know it is safe to say hundreds of them, but we can get back to you, um, Heather, with some sure. specifics on that. Thank you. Don't mind for mm -hmm. Sylvia and for you and the county executive. You know, there have been some people who've been very hesitant of getting to get the mRNA vaccine. Um, do you think that this will increase the number of vaccinated people in our county since some people have been saying, well, the protein based vaccine doesn't seem as scary to them or they seem more receptive to that than the mRNA vaccine? Look, I'm, I'm certainly hoping that's true. I mean, this has been our concern, because as long as if people refuse to take the mRNA vaccine, um, we've got this constant pool of people who aren't protected and who can get sick and who can, you know, in the worst cases, they get sicker than vaccinated people. So the advantage of the vaccines is even if you do get a COVID case, they tend to be mild cases. So if we could knock down the circulation of the worst cases of COVID, 
that would be a good thing. It would take stress off some of our facilities. It would put less people at, at risk. I think it would just kind of level level the playing field for everybody. I mean, I like I said, didn't agree with people's logic for not taking an mRNA, but at the end of the day, all it really matters is that everybody gets vaccinated. And this opens the path to everybody getting vaccinated. And so um, I'm hoping that, you know, what you said is what happens here. More people come in, they get these shots. We get even higher levels of resistance in the community to COVID, and uh, we all wind up better for that. And we do have research, as I mentioned earlier, um, Heather, that you know, 25 to 30 percent of people say they're looking for a protein-based option. We think that's going to translate into exactly what you and Mark are saying, which is encouraging more people to get vaccinated who may, for whatever reason, have been hesitant to do so before. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, County Executive. Thank you, Heather. Scott Broom? Sure. Uh, my primary questions are off topic, but with respect to Ms. Taylor's time, if you can come back to me on those, I do have a question on this, uh, on the vaccine, and that is uh, the protein-based vaccines, are, are, are the, are the uh, developers able to flex more quickly with variants uh, on this side of the business as opposed to the uh, RMA or whatever it's described as? Um, how does that work? Is it are, are you all quicker at adapting, or about the same, or slower? So I think you know I'm I'm um, less I think able to be comparative. I don't know what the mRNA process is. What I can tell you is that we expect that. Um, COVID variants will continue to rise, and as a result, every year we're probably going to need new uh, vaccines for COVID. So we saw that for this season, XBB lineage vaccines. You know, we said we need about three to six months, which is incredibly impressive when you think of needing three to six months to create and then manufacture and then get to market a vaccine. And that's exactly what we've done this season. So in June, the strain was picked for the coming season, and here we are in October, you know, millions of doses already in to date, millions more to come into the United States, and also being authorized and recommended for use. So we're ready to go in a very, very quick amount of time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Scott. Members of the media, any more questions regarding Novavax and the vaccine? Raise your hand. No more questions regarding this topic. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Taylor, for joining us uh, this morning afternoon. And uh, if you need to go, you thank you for being here today, Mr. Khan Executive. I will do that. Thank you so much for having us. Bye thank right. you very much for joining us. It's Absolutely. really helpful. Thank you again, Mark. Sure. Um, so just, yeah, somebody mentioned the uh, people we know getting COVID. It's ironic that you should bring that up. I, as I said, I'm going to go visit, spending today and tomorrow visiting uh, solid waste facilities out here. Our new Department of Environmental Protection director was supposed to fly out <laughs> this morning and meet me here, and we were going to do the tour together and meet these companies, and he got COVID, and so I'm doing this on my own, uh, but it'll be fine. But it's just, you know, an example of like, you know, COVID still continues to interfere in the normal process of things. And I'm firsthand witnessing it right now. So in other news, um, this week we had a big announcement from another of our big biotech companies, DECA Biosciences. Uh, the CEO announced that um, they're issuing a 20 million series B2 round of funding uh, to help advance the immunology therapy through clinical trial processes. And that's the key to getting anything to a market is getting through the clinical trials. DECA was founded here in Montgomery County. It had some support from local men mentors. They were able to move into Montgomery County Incubator in Germantown, and soon they're going to be graduating to new commercial lab space here in the county. This is one of the most important things that the county has to focus on, is making sure we have enough um, lab space and that we have enough incubators in the county to help companies grow. Um, a lot of these things start with very early, in very early stages without a lot of need for expensive equipment. I know of a company in Frederick that followed that model, and then as they developed their processes, they need larger spaces and more equipment. And so I'm really excited that this company is graduating to new commercial lab space. That's gonna be a big deal and a good sign for their future direction. 
And life sciences, biotech businesses, success like Novavax and DECA are reasons why our region climbed from fourth to third largest life science cluster in the nation. That's not a small thing, folks. It's also why we're working with our university system to create the University of Maryland's Institute for Health Computing at the North Bethesda Metro Station. We're the only cluster in the nation's top 10 clusters that's not anchored by graduate level research. And this was, you know, an effort uh, that we reached an agreement with, with the University of Maryland to start bringing that research into the county. The Institute for Health Computing is a critical part of our plan to create a biotech infrastructure here that will continue to foster expansion and attraction of new companies, along with efforts to grow a larger and more skilled workforce that's going to be needed for this endeavor. You know, as, as we look around, one of the things we're doing now, meeting with uh, companies in the sector and looking at other uh, centers around the country and identifying, you know, what we have and what things we're missing that other places have. Uh, we want to make sure that we put together all the pieces of what would be, you know, a premier life sciences center by making sure we have the lab space, we've got training facilities that we can ensure a company, if they come here, they'll find a workforce and they'll find the kind of technology they need to grow. So this is really important for us. So I will say finally that it was good news that the University of Maryland Board of Regents approved funding for leasing office space in North Bethesda. Um, the Institute for Health Computing is going to start in about 27,000 square feet, I think, on Executive Boulevard. Um, they'll be in that space. We'll, they'll be bringing in their equipment um, by, well, it's October, so they should be doing it now. And uh, we're looking forward to them launching as soon as the equipment's up running and tested. And that'll keep them until um, working with the state and University of Maryland system, we build a facility on the uh, metro station. We know WMATA would like it to be the signature um, institution on the metro station. I think it's a perfect institution to be on top of the metro station. So I'm really excited about the direction we're moving in. Um, in August, our unemployment rate was just 1.6%. So it's a tenth of percent increase from our historic unemployment lows in June and July. So now we've got three months in a row of 1.5, 1.5, 1.6. And we've done that even as the number of job vacancies, the number of job offerings are increasing, which means we're probably getting a pretty fair absorption right now. Uh, the national unemployment rate for August is 3.8. It's more than twice as high as our number. Fairfax was 2.6, Arlington 2.1, and the district was 5.0. So our unemployment rates are really strong. Um, our life science is interesting to help drive our low unemployment numbers, but it's also in, in recovery, in line with recovery in hospitality industries. I know that, you know, we've basically recovered. Uh, we have as many or more restaurants as we had before COVID, and, and of course, as many or more liquor licenses as we had before. So, you know, the county's continuing to invest, promote, and help our companies grow here and thrive. Uh, we've got a plan for how we're going to grow our biotech se sector, and we're beginning to get nibbles from companies that are high tech, but not in biotech, um, who have approached us about possible projects in the county. So when we have things to announce, we will. But it's it's an exciting change. I mean, to be seen more and more as a place to come to um, and have an industry that, you know, gets national attention front and center helps create the kind of image we want to create around the county. So for me, this is really gratifying to see this happening. And speaking of employment efforts, our county government, like everybody else in the region, you know, suffered from major job loss. Uh, during COVID, we had a combination of um, people deciding they just didn't want to work anymore. They were ready to retire. Um, sometimes they were, were ready to change jobs because the jobs they were doing were very stressful and COVID probably made them more stressful. And, you know, in, in some cases, um, we're, <laughs> we didn't fill jobs that were vacant during COVID if we know we couldn't people, we couldn't put people on the front lines. So we intentionally allowed vacancies to stack up because we were not opening offices. For example, we weren't bringing people back into libraries 
it didn't make sense to increase staffing for people who would never go to work. So our efforts to increase staffing kind of um, went along with our ability to reopen more and more of the county government and bring people back to work. And I guess everybody probably worked in similar parameters. At any rate, you know, we're being aggressive about trying to fill these positions. Yesterday, we held another successful career fair and expo in Silver Spring. It's our second attempt this year to fill vacant new positions the county has. We're doing things differently than we have done before. We are doing some interviews on the spot. Everyone was there and considered among the best candidates for a job will be contacted within the next 30 days. Uh, we are trying to end um, the persistent problem of taking months to get people hired here. So we've been working with our HR people to simplify our processes and make it much simpler to get a job in Montgomery County. Uh, it doesn't do us any good when we get good candidates, but if you can't onboard them in less than six months, there's no way they're waiting around for that job to open up. So we're improving all the processes around hiring here so we can hire people more nimbly and we can make sure people will go back, we can get people back to work and we can get departments more fully staffed. This event we had um, had a thousand people pre-registered and so we were at capacity. Um, Montgomery County government offers a lot of different career paths and a lot of, I think, pretty incredible career opportunities. And we're committed to providing our employees a work environment that values their talents, fosters their professional growth. And the average Montgomery County employee has worked for the county for over a decade, which is over twice as long as the average U.S. worker. Um, our goal is to create a culture where employees will want to spend their careers working for our residents, visitors, and businesses. And if anyone missed this week's opportunity, I encourage them to visit work4mcg.com. And four is the number four, work4mcg.com. At that website, they can stay up to date on the next career fair and hiring expo. They can get career resources and explore our pay and benefit options. Um, before we talk about our weekly health report, I want to let everyone know that our new climate change officer, Sarah Kogel-Smucker, started work in our office last week. Sarah joins our team after leading the creation of the Climate Change Division in the District of Columbia's Office of the People's Council. Um, she has more than 15 years of experience in environmental issues prior to her work in the district. She served as senior counsel for the New York City Law Department's Environmental Division. In this role, she advocated for the deployment of affordable clean energy initiatives, analyzed environmental legislation, and advised other divisions on climate policy. And I'm really glad to see her come on board. She shares a passion for involving the community. And that's one thing that COVID kind of took the wind out of the sails was, you know, we had this great climate committee. We had a lot of plans for using that community out in the public to educate people. And then along came COVID and things got put on hiatus. It's time to re revitalize that aspect of our work. In fact, that may be the most important aspect of our work. I think I've talked to you and you all seen the video I did about some of the things I did at my house. Um, the best ambassadors for making improvements in your house's uh, you know, energy infrastructure or in the private sector are examples of people who've already done it. And somebody you know, a business that you know, can say, I did this. It um, not only improved my energy efficiency, but it reduced my costs. Um, those are the kind of examples and stories we need to get out there. Probably far, far more effective than me just telling you we all ought to do this stuff. Uh, matters when people see other people doing it. Our goals are pretty aggressive. I think everybody knows that 80% by 2027, 100% reduction of greenhouse gases by 2035. Um, I know this timeline uh, is a decade sooner than the state's greenhouse gas emission goal, but I know that uh, Governor Moore is moving to accelerate. I know that these aggressive targets um, are truly aggressive, but the intention in setting the goals, and I was on the council when we set these goals, was to ensure that we never stop trying to solve this enormously dangerous problem. Uh, setting modest goals might have led to, you know, victory dances, but would have left an awful lot of work undone. And we wanted to make sure we weren't doing victory dances while the place is burning down around us. So we're continuing to uh, pursue the goals as aggressively as we can. 
and the government can't act alone. Without the public making choices to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions in their own lives, no changes that the government makes will be sufficient in and of themselves to achieve our climate goals. If this were just a game, losing it wouldn't be such a big deal. You know, you don't achieve your goals. That happens. That's life. But climate change is a big deal. I mean, you can see it all around you pretty much every day. Um, everywhere, this nowhere is this heading in the right direction. There aren't like good climate changes happening now. Pretty much everything you read about is bad. The projections are worse than they've ever been and on a shorter time frame than they've ever been. And I think most people are aware that something is changing and the change is not for good. Uh, so we know the county is not going to solve these issues on our own. We are not going to pretend to be the saviors of the world, but we can be a leader and we can be a model for other jurisdictions. And Sarah's works could be an important part of these efforts. And I look forward to having uh, Sarah on this briefing after she gets a few weeks here under her belt. Um, now, in the world of COVID, we're seeing a slight decline in cases. Uh, the COVID hospitalization rate has been about steady. Uh, in order to keep our COVID rates and especially hospitalizations to a minimum, we have to continue to promote and encourage boosters. The new vaccines are widely available. You just heard about Novavax's new addition to this um, collection of vaccines, and it's, it'll be in pharmacies and through doctor's offices everywhere. It's still going to take some time to schedule an appointment, so please be patient. Uh, the county is not getting the kind of mass doses. Uh, the state is no longer, and the federal government is no longer relying on government to be the distributor of vaccines. So we've moved out of the role we had during COVID, um, but we're continuing to work with the state, our libraries, and other departments to get new supplies, rapid test kits, and masks out to places where they're easily accessible. But I also encourage you to order new test kits through the government. The federal government will deliver four test kits per address if you sign up online. So for more on our health report, I'd like to welcome Emergency Preparedness Manager, Sean O'Donnell, to break down the numbers. And hello, Sean, it's yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. County Executive. So to, to begin with, uh, wanted to share, as we talk about where our numbers are going, um, we have seen a, a gradual decline in our uh, case rates. Um, and when we look at what the variants are, we, we've seen that for um, uh, about two months now, there's been lots of these XBB subvariants that have been part of of transmission and with so many different subvariants contributing, um, it was a slow, slow rise during this wave. It will likely be a slow uh, uh, come down as well as as these continue to circulate. Um, the one of of note, this is these are national um, typing numbers. HV uh, dot one, we're starting to see that grow a little bit more nationally. Um, so again, it, it has none of this has fueled. A sharp increase. Um, it looks like the immunity gained from previous XBB um, Omicron uh, type infections and vaccinations has helped. Uh, and again, the the current vaccine, the the newer formulation, 2022, 2020, I'm sorry, 2023, 2024 vaccine um, should be effective against these types of variants. Uh, we're looking again at our state um, test positivity. We've seen that be fairly level for a while um, with just a little bit of positivity coming down. You can see we've highlighted Montgomery County there. Um, so not a, a huge amount of change. Um, you can see here, these are our case rates from the PCR testing uh, and that, well, the amplitudes don't compare to previous waves uh, because of far fewer PCR tests. Uh, you can see that we've had a gradually declining uh, number of positive PCRs. Um, so that that's encouraging that we may be coming out of this uh, wave. But again, I'll, I'll show you some data in a, in a few minutes that um, indicates we may have just a level of COVID that persists throughout this uh, fall winter period. Um, again, going into a little more detail with our hospital numbers, I'm sorry, uh, you can see these are our local hospital numbers. These have remained relatively consistent over the last last few weeks after an, in, uh, an increase um, about a month or so ago. These have gone up and down a little bit, but uh, no drastic changes. 
at the state level, you can see week to week, uh, um, not a not a large change in those numbers. Again, this is much more modest number of hospitalizations uh, than we've had from our previous uh, waves, as you can see right here. Uh, again, these are the state numbers. Um, Looking at our own uh, emergency department volume, so uh, when when individuals go to an emergency department and, and don't become an inpatient, they're, they're often discharged with a specific diagnoses. Uh, we capture these for, for COVID. Uh, that's the top lines based on ages. You can see most of those are coming down. A little bit of activity with our, our seniors still. Um, you know, again, that's the highest sensitivity to, to, to COVID. Um, and then you can see we're, we're tracking on influenza and RSV uh, on the lower charts. And we've seen a little bit of activity recently, um, but they, they've not um, increased significantly yet. Uh, that's likely going to happen, though um, we anticipate over the next uh, month or so. Um, total ED volume has not changed uh, notably. And then um, this is the chart I wanted to, to mention. This is all the U.S. Um, emergency department visits, or at least the ones that were captured and reported to CDC. And the green line is the COVID um, ED dis discharge diagnoses. Uh, you can see across the U.S. that the most recent peak there, um, as far as amplitude, is not too far off of um, what we saw last winter. You can see last fall from 10-1 on the far left of our chart, uh, we had a sort of a an elevated baseline of COVID all the way through October, uh, November, and then in December and January, it really went up. Um, you know, we're, we're starting at a, a, a lower peak for our summer here. Um, you can also see last year, the influenza in blue, the um, RSV in purple, uh, how they impacted our emergency department visits. And again, we're, it's hard to, it, it's hard to predict the amplitude of influenza um, illnesses and transmissions. Um, and we expect a little bit less on the RSV front this year, um, but this is why we recommend everyone to get their seasonal flu shot, to get their updated COVID booster, and um, if they're eligible to get their RSV shot. Uh, we wanna to try to prevent as many serious illnesses as possible. Uh, and then just to share the last uh, data point um, here is, the, the state's overall uh, vaccination rates for influenza from the previous um, year cycle. And it, it, you know, while Montgomery County and, and Howard County uh, do better in, in relation, we see it's still less than half of uh, the residents are getting their, their flu shot. So uh, we'd like to see that higher, uh, the same with COVID. I did, nothing has changed here. Um, we still, there's lots of resources for test kits for, um, for masks and for vaccines, and we encourage people to uh, reach out. We know uh, we've had some calls from people who have had some challenges with their providers not having vaccine yet. Um, it does sound like it's getting better, more and more of it's rolling out. So please try back um, and have some patience. Um, I, I know uh, it can take a little while for this rollout to happen, but um, there should be vaccine for everyone. Um, and we encourage people to get their shots be before they start doing family gatherings. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to um, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Davis, our health officer, or Dr. Bridgers, our director, to see if they have any additional HHS updates. Nothing for me, uh, Mr. O'Donnell, ready for Q&A. Nothing for me either, thanks. Uh, Dr. Stoddard, any opening remarks? We're good. We can proceed to questions. Okay, let's take some questions. Scott Room, WSA 9. Okay, th thanks. I'm glad we have our HHS infrastructure here because this uh, uh, crosses over some. Uh, we have what uh, families view as a uh, critical crisis with this uh, assisted living and memory care place in Silver Spring, yep. called the landing of Silver Spring, announcing uh, that it's been sold and it's going to close. Um, the state is telling us of 45 days notice is all that's uh, required, and there are very few other protections in the regs and COMAR as I've read them. Uh, there seems to be a, maybe a discrepancy. Uh, federal regs under CMS seem to say 60 days, but my reporting is not mature on that. I'm not really sure what reg applies. The bottom line is we've got 53 people in memory care uh, with very uh, short notice, according to families, 
uh, who are going to have to go someplace else. And they view that as life-threatening in some cases to people whose stability really matters uh, to their overall health and well-being. Uh, my question to you is, uh, from what we know about this so far, uh, do you agree with some of these family members who feel like the protections for their elders are just shockingly inadequate in a circumstance like this? Do you have any thoughts about it you can share? Yeah. Look, you know, my experiences are anecdotal, but I know that, you know, people I know have had to deal with this say it's not easy to find memory care in the first place. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of work to find the right facility and a facility you can afford. So a lot of different things come into play. And the people who are getting the care are often not able to, you know, evaluate the decisions themselves. They, you know, they're in memory care. Um, so it's a disability in their ability to, you know, handle this. And I worry about it. I think it's going to, you know, be hard for some people. This company you know, has no need to give them a 45 day notice to start, you know, to, to evict. Um, they certainly could have run this out another month if they needed to, to make sure everybody gets taken care of properly. Um, I'm just, you know, this is all about their bottom line dollar. And it's kind of sad that you're going to put these people at risk because they have no patience to start their project, which will ultimately boot all these people out anyway. But to not take into consideration how do you do this in a way that's humane for everybody is a bit alarming. Um, but Omega you know, Health Omega Healthcare's uh, website reports that they uh, have 88,000 beds in 42 states and two countries. Uh, and that their real estate holdings are ten point three yep. billion dollars. Yep. Um, and I suspect, although I don't know, uh, Mr. County Executive, that perhaps uh, some of your county services may be called upon, uh, even though state regulations and I guess federal regulations are really uh, the issue here. Uh, can you assure residents that the county may be able to step? in to assist in a crisis if they can't find a place that's adequate to send their elders or what are your thoughts you know, so you know we we do crisis housing but we don't often do it typically for people you know who have care needs i mean they, that's just not the kind of stuff that normally comes across our table somebody gets evicted you know they they don't have money to pay rent they know they've got to move this is a whole other you know angle you know i'll defer to you know, Dr. Bridges or Dr. Davis, you know, we'll certainly do everything we can, but, uh, you know, we're certainly not equipped to handle 53 people with uh, memory care needs. That's not something the county has capacity for. So well, perhaps, I Mr. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, I am aware there's a long-term care ombudsman and perhaps Dr. Bridges or... Um, sure, Scott. Thank yes. you. So we, we've had conversations yesterday. We were advised of the 2 p.m. Um, deadline mandate yesterday our uh, aging and disability chief dr mcgee has had multiple conversations with the office of uh, health care quality and the state of maryland to look at any additional um, courses of actions or remedy to support this community we are having conversations now about any additional services either in our services to end and prevent homelessness or other spaces as part of a crisis management so, Scott, we are in contact with the state, and we're looking at the resources um, available within HHS, as Mr. Uh, County Executive Elrich indicated, to see how we can support this challenge. But again, um, the Maryland Department of Health Care, uh, Office of Health Care Quality, has taken the lead for many of these um, challenges that we have. They, we no longer, in the Department of Health and Human Services, have the licensing or regulatory um, um, status of managing or monitoring uh, challenges in this instance, or in these instances, I should say. So it's a it's a, a way of advocating for the need, but also looking at what the Department of Health and Human Services and the county is able to provide in, in, in relief and or support. But those conversations are ongoing as we speak this afternoon. Uh, I see Tom's here. He obviously has some questions, but let me just ask one more thing. And it is that uh, I read the Comar. I'm obviously not an expert on this, but but the family's point of view is that these shortcomings and protections for their elders are shocking. 
there yep. appears nothing in Comar that says that this uh, organization has to. It says they have to help find new places, but it doesn't say they have to. And it doesn't say at the end of 45 days that they have to continue to care for people in the circumstance where maybe they've got no place to go. Uh, and these family members are just beside themselves because of that. Uh, would anybody at the table uh, agree with them and perhaps advocate that, uh, since this is a Comar state law issue, that perhaps our legislators take this on in circumstances like this to provide more protection? I'll certainly raise that. And, you know, hopefully our legislators will get, in fact, our staff should make sure our legislators get briefed on what's happening so they've got a context for why we would be asking for changes. But there's got to be a longer run-up than 45 days. And, you know, it's just, you know, you, you pointed out how much wealth these guys have. It's just stunning that they would could do this to people, and it's of no concern to them. Must be nice to live in that bubble. Okay, thanks for the questions. Tom, good to see you. Thanks, Scott. Hello, Tom. Uh, that's Jara, Fox 5 DC. Good afternoon, Tom. Uh, good afternoon, Account Executive. Uh, you're in San Francisco, as you said, today, and um, it's a question about our changing government in a virtual age right now. You're able to do this briefing right now. We yep. wouldn't have been able to do this 10 years ago. And the question is about how much public engagement in person do lawmakers need to be making? Uh, recently, the Prince George's County Council actually went back to allowing members to attend meetings and vote virtually. The Montgomery County Council uh, does do uh, virtual attendance themselves. There have been some questions in the District of Columbia. You were on the county council for a long time. Uh, you do these virtual briefings for us in the media, and they're, they're very helpful for us as we cover these stories. But I know you do do a lot of in-person stuff because that's how you talk to people. So yeah. I'm curious, as a public official, where do you put the proper role of virtual attendance, whether it helps the public or hurts them in some way, and what's the balance? So, it's a, it's a really good question, and and I think you you kind of draw you alluded to a line that I think makes sense. You know, I do this I do this every week, but I'm not like I'm not making a decision off of this, right? And my job is I I come on and tell you what we're doing. And you ask me questions. You know, you never have to submit a question in advance. No one's screening your question. So this is a pretty free, free flowing back and forth. And if you're sitting in a legislative setting, though, where you're actually decision making, I think it's useful to see people. I think expecting everybody to get on Zoom calls and functions is wrong. So, you know, I thought, I thought when, you know, the park and planning did thrive on Zoom it was a joke. You know, there's no way that's the same thing. And nor did they allow the same amount of time for comments that they that they normally would have. I think there's a tendency in general for people to shrink the comment periods, which is also really hard. I mean, I was you know you know my history of activism goes before I was ever elected. You know when you when somebody tells you you've got two minutes to explain your position, you might as well just say you know, thank you for your time. That was interesting. Is you can't lay out arguments in two minutes and three minutes. And so I think we've moved away from being willing to engage people. And I always tell people, I started in Tacoma Park Council. We had meetings routinely that went to one o'clock in the morning and we let people talk. And I think letting people talk is a good thing. You don't always agree with them, but I think people need to be part of the process. And I think we do less and less that's legitimate parts of the process. You know, we've gone from you know, even as I would look at, you know, park and planning charades, which are charrettes, as they call them, um, it's like it's minimal involvement. People don't know where the involvement's going. People throw stickies up on a wall and then they never know what happens to the stickies. I, I just, I'm a big believer in more engagement from people and more willingness to talk to people. And I don't think anybody's hurt by that. And God knows, you know, I get battered sometimes by people who don't agree with me. But it is what it is, and it's what you've got to be willing to do. If Thank I wanted you. to do a job, I'd have done something else. 
Thank you, Tom. Members of the media, any more questions for the county executive and or the officials? Okay, I, I see Jeannie Bixby, Local 360. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, Lorna. Thank you. Um, hi, Mark. Um, I'm kind of switching gears here, um, but I wanted to ask you, um, Council Member Jawando just put out a statement um, about a letter, an opinion from the Maryland Attorney Attorney General on the STEP Act that Jawando has put forward, essentially um, stating that parts of the act are not um, in accordance with state law. And I just, I, I assume you maybe haven't read it. This all came out during this briefing, so I don't expect you to know everything that's said, but I just wanted to get your perspective kind of on this issue and parts of the act not being in accordance with state law. So I don't, I don't, I don't think large parts of the act are in accordance with state law. Uh, I'm not averse to some things in state law changing me. We, there, we are a list of things we've talked about wishing we could do that we can't do unless, uh, unless state law, unless state laws changed. I'd like to be able to do more traffic enforcement, particularly for repair orders, where you can just take a picture of a car with a light out or no tail light over the license and you know send the person an automated ticket rather than uh rather than having to pull the person over i'd rather our um the people who read meters be able to go down um a, a street and look for light and you know and, and run license plates and look for stolen cars which they can't do because they're not linked into the system so i think there's some things we could do that would help make people safer and, you know, and also minimize contacts. I get the issue about police contacts. Um, I think people just don't understand the history of police relations and community relations in this country. I mean, we, I don't think Montgomery County is the Montgomery County of 30 and 40 years ago. And I don't think our police are the police officers of 40 years ago, but there are a lot of communities, their memories are long and police were not considered friendly and nor were they considered neutral. And, you know, there are all too many examples in, you know, American history, our own history of police acting out of line. And so it leads to a level of distrust in the community. And it's really hard just to get up there and say, oh, that's over now, everything's fine because everything's not fine. Uh, so I think there's, you know, I, I understand concerns about stops um, we, like I said, we will work with the state legislature to try to, you know, bring as many of those things um, into a situation where you're not required to do a stop. But I have no qualms about stopping people for speeding, reckless driving, running stop signs, running stop lights, um, license. You know, we can have a debate about how late a registration can be. Um, but I think there's a point at which, uh, you know, a week or a month is one thing, six months a year is another thing. Uh, I just, I'm not fully comfortable with the STEP Act as it was introduced. I think there, but I do think there are things in worth, in there worth our trying to figure out what we can do with the state to implement some of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Athena Matthew, ABC7, good afternoon. Hi, Mr. County Executive. I have a question in reference to the Charter House apartment building in Silver Spring. Oh, yes. yep. um, two of the three elevators are out of service, and many of the seniors that live there use walkers and wheelchairs, and they say using out um, stairs oh. are not an option. Um, Montgomery County has previously provided funding for this building. Um, so what can you do, and what will, what will you do to keep um, the two for these seniors? Well, you know, we... <laughs> I just got briefed on this again, but I got to say the Charter House has had a long history of this. And the problem we run into, we were running into it on another building. We can go out and cite these people to we're blue in the face. And it's just the cost of business to them. And when they go to court, too often the judges will say, you know, if you after they are able to delay court proceedings sometimes for months, if they finally go in and fix something the day before you wind up in front of the judge, the judge says it's fixed, there's no fine. And it doesn't take into account the pain and suffering the tenants go through while they're waiting to, to get things fixed. 
So we're looking at some other tools. I'm not going to discuss them in detail right now, but the county's got to be able to act in, in the case of buildings where people are being put at risk. Um, and I consider elevators, you know, kind of a life safety issue, um, it, it, particularly in the senior building. Uh, so, you know, the fact that you know, they, they don't feel compelled to repair things quickly, the fact that they haven't dealt with rodent infestations and some of the other problems in the building um, is a real problem. But we we are struggling, and it's not because our inspectors don't go out and inspect. It's because landlords refuse to repair things in the time frames they're given, and they're able to get a pass in the courts if we take them to courts. And so the system, as usual, is stacked in favor of the wrong people instead of making sure people have a, you know, get just outcomes for the circumstances they have to endure. So we are looking and we'll probably bring bringing to the council some ways of strengthening what we can do so that people can't simply flout the law. We have a, we have a tenant right to repair, but it's very hard for tenants to, um, you know, find a plumber, uh, you get somebody to come in, then have to pay the plumbing bill, and then tell the landlord that I'm deducting the rent from deducting the bill from your rent. Um, it puts them, I think, in a in a difficult situation. We're work, working on ways to strengthen that, and what role can we give the county in that? Because this has just gone on. Um, there are too many people who do this. Not all landlords do it. I'm not saying that every landlord, you know, is running their buildings down or failing to maintain them, but the ones that are, and there are people who do this, are frequent flyers, and they're frequently bad, and they're frequently tardy in making repairs, and we will work to change that. Thank you so much. And um, going off of that, um, the landing of Silver Spring was sold and tenants will be evicted. Is your office doing anything to help these residents as well? This is the memory care. Yeah, we talked about that yeah. earlier. I mean, our folks are, you know, in contact. We're trying to figure out what kind of support we can give. As I said earlier, you know, there's no way the county's equipped to provide memory care to 53 people. So, you know, we're not, this is not something the county can assume, but we're going to help with relocation efforts. And, you know, I will support legislation at the state level to give people a longer warning time. I mean, there's no urgency. It's not like this place is closing down because it's been condemned and it must be torn down. It's being closed because the people want to renovate it and then put it back back in the market. Um, that's great for them, but the cost to these people is going to be enormous, and, and it's not easy to find empty slots. Affordability is a big issue. You might find slots, but you know, if you've ever looked at what some of these memory care places charge, um, it's certainly not for anybody who's, you know, not, you know, solidly middle class or upper middle class. Um, when you're talking thousands of dollars a month, more than typical rents, this is not an easy thing for people to get into in the first place. Got it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, members of the media. Any more questions for the county executive and or government officials? No more questions? Gone once? Twice? Well, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Stay safe. Have a great one. See you next time. Thank you all. Bye. Mm -hmm. Stay out of the hospital. If you've got COVID before, it's important that you go get your COVID booster. COVID vaccines are safe. Much safer than getting COVID-19. We all want this to end sooner than later. So go ahead and do things. Go out and live your life. But get vaccinated. Stay boosted. We can all do our part. And get back to living. You can go to getvaccineanswers.org for more information. You are loved. You are valued. You are resilient. You got this. You are there for them. We are here for you. Find free care guides at aarp.org slash caregiving. An estimated 124,000 tons of food scraps are thrown away each year in Montgomery County. Reducing food waste begins with you. Here's how. 
Plan meals in advance. Make a shopping list and check expiration dates. Cook the food you buy. Cook smaller portions to reduce leftovers. Save extra food in reusable containers. Add a label with the contents and date. Let's keep food out of the waste stream and aim for zero waste. Visit MontgomeryCountyMD.gov slash reduce food waste or call 311 to learn more. Score going to the playoffs. I can't believe I missed that. Every time I'm buzzed, I spend too much time on my phone. What? I should take your phone away. No, no, no. I'll call for a ride. Hey, why does my face look like that? <laughs> I'm, I'm playing with these new face uh, filters. Okay, you know what? <laughs> yep, that's mine. I'm going to need that back. No. Nope. Kevin! See on page four that the projections need to be blood. Next Thursday? Seriously? Thursday? Can't do that. Uh-uh. This is really inconvenient. I have yoga that day. I have no time for this. So. I can't do Thursday, but I can do Friday. Disasters don't plan ahead. You can. Talk to your loved ones about how you're going to be ready in an emergency. Don't wait. Communicate. back from summer recess and has hit the ground running. Welcome to Council in Brief. I'm your host, Mershai Sahalu, and I have all the updates for you. The largest pedestrian safety package since the adoption of Vision Zero was signed into law. The new law, spearheaded by Council President Evan Glass. We need government at all levels to help make our streets safe for everyone. We'll create safer streets for pedestrians cyclists, and drivers on Montgomery County roadways. Really good day for Montgomery County because with the passage and signing of this law, we are going to make our roads safer. This year alone, more than 400 individuals have been injured while walking or biking. A Gaithersburg High School student was hit by a driver at her bus stop. And as of today, 12 people have been tragically killed. I lost my sweet, gentle son, Brett, as he was crossing Rockville Pike. This legislation is going to help us with those efforts by making sure that pedestrians can safely cross, not only by prohibiting right turn on reds in our downtown areas, but also by giving our pedestrians additional time to cross the street. Council President Glass also recently held a press conference to introduce legislation that would require gun retailers in Montgomery County to provide information at points of sale on suicide prevention and firearm safety. This legislation will require gun and ammunition retailers in Montgomery County to display and distribute information relating to suicide prevention and how individuals can access help. People who are making rash decisions need to take a pause and the information that we will be providing them is in life-saving information. It is a vital step toward ensuring that families across our county have resources that prevent those at higher risk of having easy access to a gun. Councilmember Natalie Fani Gonzalez, along with Montgomery County Police Department officials, hosted a community conversation to help address local residents' questions and concerns regarding the new drone as a first responder pilot program. Crime is rising everywhere, not just in Montgomery County, but across the nation. Um, and we need to make sure the business community, you know, small businesses or residents feel safe walking and biking in our neighborhoods. They have submitted a proposal to use a drone technology to basically re reduce the amount of time when they show up during a crime seen. Basically, the proposal was given to us during the, bu the, the last budget, but we haven't had any community conversations about it. Anything that you do with high technology in the police, it's, it's we need to talk to the community, especially on, on the privacy concerns that people may have. This is important because MCPD serves the community, right? So we work for the community. And we're currently dealing with a staffing crisis, and we're trying to maintain the service and the excellence that we provide to the community. So one way to do that is through technology. But as part of that technology, we want to involve the community because there are a lot of questions, there's a lot of concerns, and we want to actually tell the public what the program is, and more importantly, what it's not. And they're basically, with some technology we have, we can get the drones to an emergency before officers on the ground. There may be times where the ground officer isn't even needed to respond, and we can let them go 
to another emergency. I think that this that this is very necessary that people become aware and become informed of what it is and what it isn't for this uh, for these types of drones. And lastly, Councilmember Kate Stewart recently hosted the Buckets and Beats Silver Spring Youth Block Party to bring youth together through sports and the arts. We're so excited to be here today for our youth block party on Veterans Plaza. And we have a lot of different events from basketball, uh, skateboarding, arts events, and we have community organizations here uh, because we wanted this to be an afternoon for young people. I think it's a great event for, you know, the youth out here in Silver Spring. It's a great way to, like, you know, get people to interact with the community in a different type of way. Um, especially for skateboarding and basketball players right now. I'm, I'm looking at it right now and you got a whole skate park on the strip where I grew up personally skating where there's no skate park in this area. You need more than just guidance from home. You need the community to be involved in your life. I want them to feel like, you know, overall we care about them. And they, they feel that this is something that they can look forward to each and every year. Well, this wraps up this edition of Council in Brief. I'm Rashai Salu. Thanks for watching. I am Jeremy Shuck, Field Supervisor at the Montgomery County Department of Permitting Services, with some important information for you about deck safety. A building permit is required for all decks, regardless of the height above grade. On average, DPS issues about 1,000 deck permits a year. For decks constructed with stairway illumination and hot tubs or spas, an electrical permit may also be required. These permits are to ensure the structure is safe and secure for you and your guests. A typical deck inspection takes just about 15 to 20 minutes and involves assessing the ledger, fasteners, guardrail, stairs, and the condition and integrity of the wood. Specifically, DPS inspectors are looking at the overall condition of the deck and can make recommendations based on the current building code. Older decks may not meet today's stricter building code standards. One example is picket spacing. Current code allows a four inch gap between pickets. Most deck collapses are caused by a failure at the ledger. That's at the connection to the house. We always check the ledger attachment method. Is the ledger flashed? Is it bolted? Is it connected with ledger locks? Or worst case, is it nailed? Cleaning and sealing your deck properly will extend the life of your deck. A properly maintained deck can be enjoyed for 15 to 20 years. We get a lot of questions about decks at DPS, and the best advice we have for homeowners concerned about safety is to consult a licensed engineer or contractor to check the structural stability of your deck. You will find a list of resources, frequently asked questions and answers, and a deck maintenance inspection checklist on the DPS website at montgomerycountymd.gov slash dps. Got questions? Call 311 or 240-777-0311. For the Department of Permitting Services, I am Jeremy Shell.